All right, welcome app workshop. This is uh, this is going to be an interesting experiment, I think. Uh, Hoon School and App School have had this background that I think somewhat necessarily kind of looks more like a conventional class where there's just a lot of information you have to trawl through to just just understand what's going on, right? Like until you can read runes, until you know what a core is, until you know like the basic idea of a gall agent, it's really hard to do a lot with urban app development. So those have tended to be more just, you know, I or Jack or someone stands up and like tries to give you as much information as possible. What I'd like to do with App Workshop is far more in the vein of uh, we're going to pull up software, we're going to run it, we're going to play with it. Uh, you know, there are no dumb topical questions. Like there are probably simple things about these these apps that I've looked at that I honestly don't know correctly that I you know that I that I haven't delved into to figure out exactly what's going on with yet. So I would really appreciate you know you just interrupt me, ask questions. Like let's let's dive into every detail of what's going on with these with these apps. Our format is going to be between an hour to 90 minutes um, every two weeks for this. So it'll probably feel like a little bit less uh, in terms of in terms of the work required than app school did. I'm also I've decided not to do homework for this in favor of just having you I'm going to give you the lesson notes. I'm going to give you readings. I'm going to give you tutorials. Uh, you know, read those, work through those, figure out uh, what you need to figure out from those. But we are going to have a capstone project, and that's going to be the requirement to be a finisher. And there are three tiers of the capstone project. There's an easy, medium, and hard. So you'll be able to dial to where you think a good, a good challenge is. Um, I think all of them would, in fact, be worthy uh not only portfolio pieces but like bounties like the, these are we're at the point of of you being able to write pretty serious app software uh, in doing this so that's what that's where we will head by when does this wrap up may june i think it wraps up in june so you'll be you know by the time we look at the front end stuff and close this out we'll be pretty deep in the weeds on what's actually going on with uh with all these urban agents now okay so i i chose to call this first one server actions and this is built around the idea that one of urban's primary use cases and one of the ways that it was advertised for a long time was that it was a personal server and to figure out like what this means and what this does for us, we have to consider what a server does, right? So, so etymologically, we're saying a server serves a service, right? A, a service is a thing served by a server. Like it's terrible. It's all it's all tangled up. But what it means is we basically have some sort of computation or coordination process running somewhere that we are tapping into as necessary as, as a, what we would call a client to keep things running. So a conventional web server, uh, you know, is we're, we're running this and we're interacting with it anytime that we need to do something uh, that, that changes the state remotely or needs to communicate with other machines. But it's a system daemon. It's just this process that's running continuously. And the other thing you've looked at recently in Urbit terms that are also system daemons or are gall agents. So Urbit exec Urbit's overall execution model actually fits this niche of being a server, a server process very nicely. So essentially a server is, is kind of a it's kind of a centralized physical or logical device that's going to talk to other devices as clients. This doesn't mean that it's a web server. Right, you could have a you could have a printer server, you could have a mail server, you could have a file server. Uh, other things can be built along this model, and we can use our Urbit in those kinds of ways. There's there's kind of an interesting um, angle enabled by Azimuth and Urbit ID 
to, to think of Urbit as an identity server as well, right? That you can actually just access the public key infrastructure uh, by means of the Urbit ship. So uh, we'll, we'll play around with this. The two major operational models that servers have, uh, you can have a request response model, which is more like a poke and a gift in Arvo terms. You know, I make a request for information, I get a response back and I process that response. So request response, and then the other one is the pub sub, the publish subscribe model. And this looks more like subscriptions and updates where you simply tell it, I want to watch for this information. So we, you know, we use a path to indicate that, but essentially when you subscribe to a path, we're saying, this is the set of information. This is the collection of information that I would like you to update me with information on as I continue to work with it. So, so we have pub sub that works that way. And we have request response that works the other way. And this is why we have uh, basically on poke on peak and, um, or excuse me, um, on poke. Well, okay, there's on agent and there's on peak. They're kind of do, doing different things. And then um, on watch and, um, and on agent on Arvo on the other side. Now, the most obvious place to start is with a web server. Like, what does it look like to do a web server in Urbit? So let's briefly look at what an HTTP request actually is. And it is doing that thing. There we go. There we go. Okay. I need to probably shrink this up so you can see my whole screen since it tends to hide things. All right. We're not going to do a ton of slides, but we need to we need to take a look at slides here somewhat. Okay, here we go. So hypertext transfer protocol. Right. What that means is, uh, you know, even if we're serving something like a web page, what it means is that we have a a header message that structures the information that's coming in uh, that that we want to work with. So if we want to request information, we send an HTTP request. Uh, this is a message, it's like a poke in a gall agent. It means that we're triggering some action on the server. So if we're communicating via HTTP, then we're triggering the server action. Uh, we're gonna specify a method like get, put, or post. Uh, let's see, this one probably drops it down into the uh, into the body of this. No, 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 there's the post. Okay, oh, oh, right, right. So at the top, so this is, a, this is a post message. Put and post are similar. They have some subtle differences, um, but you can you can handle either of them coming through, uh, through, an, through an error agent. So a get is basically your request for information and then a put or a post is, is a send of information. I'm, I'm giving information to the server. And so there's this standard wrapper that says, you know, what kind of request is this? What type of browser did this come from? Uh, what's what are the the language settings and encoding settings and so forth that are that are configured for that? Then there are the general headers and representation headers that that expose other other parts of what's going on with this. Now, let me keep that chat open too and out of your way. Now, if you've done you know, web web programming before, then then this is pretty basic. But this is this is this block that we have to put at the beginning. And once you have the content length, then you're able to send this other block of information, and it knows how much information to receive. A server response, the the thing you're going to get back from the server will look a little bit different. It'll also have an HTTP version, and it will have a code at the top. There's a response code here. It is 200 OK. Um, that is our, our normal response if things have worked correctly. And then there's 404 not found. And then there are a zillion other error and special meshes codes, um, deprecated codes, everything. Um, and so this gives you a lot of information about like what, what you're actually getting. Now, the nice thing about working with air is that the actual mechanics of dealing with these headers by air and by uh, lib server. So you probably saw in one of the last app school lessons that we had imported lib server to do some things for us. 
Um, lib server is one of the ways that we wrap this. So we can just give it a code that, you know, a response code like 200 and the information that we want passed on, and it will fill in all the rest of the, uh, the boilerplate that's necessary for that communication. So, and so forth, that'll make it, excuse me. Uh, and they also have codes for dealing with uh, uh, different things like redirects or requiring logins and, and, and so forth in all these cases. Let me actually move over to an urbit. So I have this open. Yep, I know I can see that. All right. So let me run just a Zod and see how this is working for me here. All right. And VI. All right. Oh, and keep that chat open for you. Yeah, this is the new the new Urbit font. Um, I like it. It does it does nice things. Let me know if it's too small, and um, I can adjust it. Or and there's also there's like a semi bold version that might be more legible as well. So anyway, let me let me know if I can increase increase the legibility there. All right. So uh, what I was going to say is you know like like lib server. Uh, it has code that lets you do things like send server. Um, login redirect and then the path to which the the redirect should take place this sort of thing so you can you can send a message that basically says uh you know ensure that they've authenticated and if they if they've authenticated and you know you you air takes care of the cookie and everything you don't have to worry about that once you've actually set it up um then redirect to to the agent make sure that it comes back here for instance now one one good thing uh you know one good place to start i think there's a, there's a couple of good places to start for for web web page servers so officially the font is not released yet um we're using it internally to work out the last kinks of the design but uh, we don't have it distributed yet we will soon um i think it's technically under license still until it's released and then it will be under an open source license. So, all right. So has anyone played with feature or uh, what was the other one? Flap before. You can talk to me. Okay. Okay. All right. So feature, yeah, feature. And then there's blog. Um, I'm actually going to come back to blog at the end when we talk about front end stuff, because it has a lot more rendering code in it. So it, it's a similar sort of idea, but it's, but it's uh, working there. All right. So, so question here, if you use an Urbit ship to serve stuff, do other ships, do other people need to see Urbit to uh, access the content you're serving? No, you can put the requirement on it for that. You can, you know, you can require an Urbit authentication, but yes, you can, you can serve material and your Urbit is just behaving as a regular server. Uh, the fundamental difference would be is there's a, there's a, uh, I forget exactly, I'll have to look at this in a minute. There's basically, there's a, there's a uh, authenticated something or other, uh, it's, it's some, there's some tag you have that, that actually takes care of making sure that you're authenticated. Um, and so you can use that as a fence to make sure that um, anyone is logged in to the local ship that they're on urban, you know, like whatever, whatever you want to do, whatever resolution you'd like the access to be brokered by. Um, but in, in general, you can't open this up to a generic page. And so feature will do this. So feature is almost, but not quite the simplest possible page hosting app. And when we look at it in a minute, you'll see why it's not quite the, the simplest possible. And then the other one is Flap, uh, which is the, the first version of this I gave as a, as a tutorial at Assembly in 2022. But this is, uh, this is a JavaScript page uh, with, a, with a shared leaderboard on the back end. And so Urbit takes care of the back end that communicates between things, but it also serves the web page that you're running locally that all the JavaScript comes through. All right. Um, so these are these are the ones that we we want to start off by by taking a look at here. 
Uh, let me, that's the right way to do this. The other thing I'm going to have to figure out uh, with, with uh, App Workshop is what is the right way to share screens with this? Um, let's do it this way. All right. Oh, that's right. There's a, there's an app workbook feature. This is, this is where we're going to be working it is here. And let me go ahead and share this page. Oh no, it's doing the thing where it won't, doesn't want to see my, oh, there it is, okay. Yeah, so Sentinel Beacon is is a, is a different kind of thing where um, you are, uh, you're basically able to use the Urbit ship to generate a code that lets you authenticate to someone that you, um, you're actually doing this. Uh, we've actually got a, a major update to Sentinel Beacon planned as soon as uh, Vienna implements their side of it because it changes the endpoint some. Uh, and it has more um, security and authentication features related to it. All right. So this is Handful Dovned. This was written in response to Justin Murphy's uh, challenge on Twitter to just write him, write him an, an app that does this thing. So... Let's see, I guess we don't have what we used to have in browsers, which is show this uh, this page only. So let me see if I can. All right, we'll go with this. All right. My basic model, I use this in app works and excuse me, in app school. I'm going to stick with it. I think it's best when you're writing a new app to start with the structure file and get the idea of what are your kinds of operations that you're doing correct first? So I recommend writing the structure file and then writing the agent file with the pokes and then dealing with, you know, and, and, and then, then dealing with the subscription stuff and, excuse me, working in that order. So our structure file means that we have an action and the only action we have is to receive a new page, which is an HTML cord. So it's gonna it's gonna receive that that information there, uh, and since we're not doing anything special with this with this otherwise, we're not going to need to include mark files. Um, one of the interesting things that you'll come to realize is that you know we sort of advertise marks one way in the beginning, which is that they're they're kind of like um, you know file handlers or like data type converters, and that's one of the things they are. But they're also more general than the actual files because you can refer to marks that don't actually have files. So I can talk about send feature hep action. And I can be talking about this action here. And as long as I don't actually do anything that requires a transformation through a noun, uh, this will just work. And I won't actually need to make mark files for, uh, for feature in that case. All right, then once we have that, all right. So, so let me give you the description of what, what this agent does. It serves a web page that is an HTML file that is located at app faz feature UE faz or app feature UE dot HTML. So the, the faz on the end here is because Urbit doesn't do dots in file names. That's the mark on the end because it's an HTML file. So we're actually just, we have an HTML file that is on our ship. It's part of our desk. There's nothing, nothing else special about it. It's just a, a regular HTML file. So feature can serve that file, but feature can also accept new HTML and serve that HTML at a different URL. So, so uh, we're gonna have two URLs registered with this. One of them is going to serve simply feature ui.html, and one of them is going to serve whatever the internal state of this agent is. And this is what I meant by this isn't quite the simplest possible, because the simplest possible wouldn't let us change the internal state. It would just load the file using fastar, 
and then um, pull this value in. So when we build this, all right, so we're, we have our structure file for feature. We have our libraries, debug, default agent, server. Those are pretty standard. And then Schooner. Schooner is a Cordis library that is designed to make handling response codes easier. So we'll see it in practice here. Um, I think it's a good library. Um, uh, one of the possible exercises for you to complete with this is to extend it slightly to handle other MIME types. Uh, and that's actually something in the flap lesson we will need to do. Uh, so we're going to import this with FASTAR. And so what FASTAR does is it takes a name, which is going to be the name by which we'll know this information inside of our ship or inside of our agent, a mark, so send HTML, and then a path. So it is going to load the contents of FAS app, FAS feature UE dot HTML with the HTML mark and then name it feature UE. And then we'll be able to refer to it. And it's it's going to be an HTML typed um, value. Like we'll, we'll just be able to use it directly. Let's see. I don't think there was anything special in our boilerplate here at the top. We are explicitly handling the apps feature endpoint here. Um, sometimes people do this. Sometimes uh, they just let the docket treaty stuff, I guess treaty, um, handle that for you. It depends on exactly how you're building your app and your, and your front end and everything. But, but for here, we're explicitly registering that this will connect to apps, apps feature. And you don't actually have to connect at apps. So, uh, you know, pals and rumors both connect just at FAS pals, FAS rumors. So you don't have to, to hew to this standard here, but I think it's a good idea to, to keep that in mind for, for now. All right, let's see. On save, on load, nothing special there. Okay, on poke. Uh, let's see if I had any notes I wanted to bring up there specifically about on poke. Okay, so what we're getting in on poke, we get a mark and a vase, that's normal. Then depending on the kind of mark that's associated with it, we do a switch. And I think the only, yeah, the only the only mark we're gonna handle here is handle HTTP request. Um, sorry, this is loading a bit, a bit sluggishly. I think it's not happy about also broadcasting this at the same time. Handle HTTP request. This is an, an air type. So this is what air marks incoming HTTP requests with. And an HTTP request is, of course, is something that has the header that we looked at earlier. We are going to unwrap it here, which is going to produce cards. So we're, we're pinning this value in this tisket. So whatever cards result from handle HTTP will be passed into cards. And then the final return from on poke will be the cell of cards in this. So it's a regular clip card cab this. All right, so what's this doing? Zapgal, what do we remember about Zapgal? What does Zapgal do for us? Unpacks a vase. Yep, so we can give it a type and an associated value. And it basically elevates this value back into our namespace in a way. Okay, like we're sort of we're sort of lifting it back out, um, and so we received a vase. We're operating on it here. So the types that we're associating with it is a is a cell of pat ta, and then the inbound request error, which is like the the data that's associated with this. Um, I, have, I have a question. Yep. So, uh, in the Erie guide. The um, the unpacked vase was handled as a pair. They did pair TA. Okay. Uh, does that does that not make that doesn't make any difference, right? You no, it doesn't, right? So you can do a pair of two values, and it will generate a cell that looks like this. Cool. But just with the P and Q faces, right? Yes, it'll include the faces, and it's also it makes working with maps and sets and things like that a little bit easier. So I, I normally use pair when I'm working with maps, trees, sets, and I normally don't bother with it otherwise. 
but yeah, it's another case where there's there's more than one way to build the same thing. All right, handle HTTP. We're going to use a barcat. All right, so remember what a barcat does is it creates a core with the default buck arm, which is the first content here, this content, and then other associated arms downstream. This is a reasonably good model to use in this kind of context where we have a, a you know an arm here that's going to do a single thing for us, like on poke, uh, a short on poke. If this were much longer, I would say push this off to either a helper core or a library and do it that way. But in this case, I think this, this works well. So this defines a handle HTTP arm, and then there's some um, JavaScript unwrappers that uh, produce things for us down here. So these are all inside of that same bar cut uh, core. Sorry, it is really not happy about me scrolling here. Okay. So handle HTTP. So the two values that we unpacked that vase into were a PAT TA and an inbound request. So a PAT TA is an error ID. It's the information basically about like where this stuff is going later on. And I think we actually don't use it anywhere in here. Uh, it's, it's like a wire. It's like the same kind of idea of like there's a way of identifying uh, the associated session and requesting this kind of information. So we, we, don't, we don't use it here. We're going to return our cards state thing as normal. Uh, this is kind of a cryptic little line. Tisfaz com request line call server, parse request line server, UR request inbound request. Essentially, what we're doing here is we are unwrapping the request information, things like the URL, because this is what gives us information about how to route the incoming request. Uh, so that's what that comma is doing there is it's telling it to like unwrap the the face around this uh, it's kind of an odd usage there's a few places like in threads where this shows up but it's but it's an interesting usage uh oh we do actually use the air id here okay so take a look at this line what do you think this line is doing look at the the right hand part first even without knowing what schooner does other than that it handles responses what is this doing Uh, is it sending the response along the wire? It's not set. So it what? It, um, so send is a new gate, right? Send is a new gate. Yeah. So it's not sending the response along the wire yet. It's currying the response into the response gate and returning you a gate that will only send the response along that that error ID. So it's setting it up for what you're talking about doing. So now I'll be able to use send as a regular gate down here. And all I have to do is give it my, my code and whatever, whatever structure my code expects. All right. I think it's it's kind of a it's kind of a nifty, a nifty statement. I like it. All right, then we're going to switch on the request method from our inbound request. All right. So it's going to be a post or it's going to be a get. There's also puts, but we don't, we're not going to handle puts here. Um, and then our default is to send a 405, which is like, um, I don't remember what 405 is. 500 is like server type thing happening. 405 might be invalid method. Um, anyway, some, anyway, it's something's gone wrong, right? We don't, we don't really care. It's just that something, something's gone wrong. And that's set up as a cell of the cards that send is going to produce with that value. And then the state method not allowed. Okay, yep. Yeah. All right. So it won't accept a put is, is basically the, the, the short version of that. All right. So let's go to get first. Let's skip post for now because post changes the state. Let's go to get. What get is going to do is it's going to look over the site and the default is to say 404, we don't have your site. And then it's going to branch over some other options here. So one of the options is you can navigate to your urbit URL slash feature slash public slash app slash feature slash public. And if you do that, it will serve you with a 200 code, the page marked as HTML. So if you want to serve that page, this is how you serve that page in a single line. 
uh, using whatever magic schooner does internally that, that, that cleans up what uh, lib server would have to do otherwise. If you navigate to your Urbit FAS apps FAS feature, what it does is it checks whether or not you are authenticated. Is this inbound request authenticated? If it is not authenticated, it will direct you to redirect to login, right? So it'll send you to login and then that redirect, is it telling it to act with uh, Iris so that it sends you back to this point once you completed the login? And then otherwise it will serve to you feature UE, which is that page that's associated that we loaded at the beginning. So this agent is interesting because it, it basically has um, three branches here for serving a page. One is you have a feature UE page that you saved, but you must be logged in to see it. Okay, so it has so it has a, a login feature, and we could drop this out if we didn't want it, or we could keep it here. So that's that's kind of two options there. The other is is if we have loaded a page, uh, which is the internal state, like if we've given it HTML as a page, then it will serve you that internal state, whatever whatever that's been set. That's what the post request is going to do. So we'll look at the post request in a minute. All right. So that's that's it. That's all that this is doing for us. Um, then there's some JSON, JSON junk and everything. But if you want to serve a page, you could serve a page with or without authentication in, you know, two, two wrapped um, uh, switch statements and then uh, the, the schooner response. So basic page serving is, I think, reasonably straightforward. It's, it's boilerplate, like, you know, you're probably not going to sit down and just like, Rederive exactly this code from scratch, but if you're going to serve pages, copy this code. It's it's fantastic. It does exactly what you want. Uh, there's no sale. Um, sale is the internal markup language used for HTML. Uh, there's no rudder. I think sale and rudder are good. Uh, I think that you don't really want to start there. They're a lot more complicated than you want to start with. It was going to say. I mean, sorry. You're um, how like precisely how complex is sale like like how how much of a uh, oh damn moment am I in for when I finally decide to figure that out? Um, let me see if uh, there's a good example here. Well, the sale itself is just you know more simple, even simpler HTML, but rudder rudder is quite quite a thing. So. Yeah, sale. <laughs> Right, I think that's a fair way to say it. Sale is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not actually sure where the sale page comes from here. Apps, pals, web using. Okay, let's look at. Yeah, I meant to do uh, for the final app school homework. I meant to like do a little write up of how uh, rumors and Rudder fit together, but I, I I I think I have a good idea of how Rudder's works. So I just got discouraged and never finished writing the thing. Yeah. Okay, this is what sale looks like. So they're prefixed with mix. And then it, it doesn't require you to close tags the same way. So open tags that do require a corresponding closing, like a head or a body tag, there will be uh, just a tis tis at the bottom. Um, and then attributes are included parenthetically. And then anything that's inside of it uh, will get will get automatically uh, included. Um, it's not bad. I think it's I think it's fairly clean. I would actually like a tool. Maybe this is a good chat GPT thing. I would like a tool that would convert HTML to sale and back and forth. Um, and it's it, these are nice because you can build pages dynamically from Hoon code. Right? So I can I can include Hoon expressions in here and build the components of this page dynamically inside of this table. This is how pals are actually loaded here, which is which is pretty neat. But it's kind of its own thing, and so I haven't I haven't really bothered to like try and teach it anywhere. Uh, but it's good. It, it doesn't. So you can include um, JavaScript with it and CSS and stuff, but it's it, you're doing like this kind of thing where there's just an arm that has a a, a tape or a cord inside of it. Um, Copilot does 
Copilot will do Hoon, but it's like not very smart Hoon at all. And it doesn't understand types like remotely in, in Hoon at all. All right. Let's look at this post. Let's look at this post. So if you are authenticated and you don't have a body in your request, excuse me, and you do have a body in your request, Oh, let, let, let me go through this. So make sure you're authenticated. If you're not authenticated, log in redirect. Make sure you have a body. If you don't have a body, then just go back to invalid method or method not supported or whatever it was called. Otherwise, you have sent me a post request with text content. That text content, I will DJSON from this uh, terrible, terrible statement here. And then I will pass this through my DJSON action mark with, or you know arm that I defined below. And then I'll turn this over to handle action, which is what will actually turn this into a, a page. So here's DJS, DJS action. It's just a single, like there's a page as a, as a string, uh, pretty like super straightforward. Um, I don't think feature actually has a front end by itself. So you actually have to do this with curl at the command line, which is kind of odd, but uh, you can do it here anyway. Okay, and then what handle action is going to do is it's going to return your quip card cab state. And what you're going to do is you're going to update the current state with the HTML of the action that you just received. So you're going to change the internal states page with the HTML you just received. That's all feature does. Okay, so, so like in a nutshell, here's your simple server. Here's what your server does. Uh, there's nothing nothing else fancy. This is in here and on watch. Um, I think that's just for the uh, for the uh, browser side connection. Uh, sometimes in these you see some boilerplate around on Arvo as well, but it's not in here. Yeah, so if you wanted to have more than one page at a time, like that would be pretty straightforward to do. You just you'd have like a set of pages, and then you would register uh, rather than explicitly doing your switch like this you would be searching inside of a, a uh, like a map or a set or something like that, right? That has these values for you. Like you could do that. You could do that right now. Um, you could probably do that in an afternoon and build that. So, all right, that's, uh, that's feature. That's what we wanted to see with feature. Next one, we're gonna take a look at flap. All right. So flap's idea is uh, we're gonna have, I think I probably don't have a ship that's actually running this. Let me check that real quick. Uh, if you have any questions, that was a great time to ask them while I see if I have a fake Zod that has flap running in it already. Oh, it looks like I do. All right. <laughs> I'm glad it's not, uh, you know, 70% humidity in Miami while you're hunting for fake Zod this time. <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. Um, let's see. I actually kept this stuff around, which is kind of funny. Oh, it's going to migrate the loom. Oh, hopefully that doesn't take very long. Oh, that didn't take long at all. Fantastic. All right. There's my comic code. To localhost 8082. And let's see if this version of flap is working. Okay, so this is this is the idea here is there's a there's a JavaScript game and it's a regular JavaScript game. Like we change almost nothing about the JavaScript. Except that when you get a score, it will propagate that score back to your ship. And then your ship will use that to communicate with your pals to maintain a leaderboard across everyone's ship. That's all that happens here. All right. Um, right. 
so you know i could play this stupid game but i got so sick of like actually playing this this silly thing um, and it's like a little bit laggy when i'm running zoom so it's like even worse um but anyway so this this is what this is what we do but all of this is served from the urban ship right this is served from from my urban that's what um uh, that's what this this tutorial is doing here so the idea that I introduced in the last app school that, I, that I, I've been playing with is the terminology here is that we have verticals and we have horizontals. And the idea of a vertical is, I called it update here, but it's that your ship is talking to a client, uh, presumably a browser, but it could be a, a CLI or something else. And then you have horizontals, which are peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So your ships are communicating between themselves. So here we call this a flap update to the browser and a flap action, or maybe that's backwards. Anyway, one of them's an action, one of them's an update. I think maybe update is, is back and forth between the ship. Um, so this is this is how we set up the, the data model and everything. So um, most of this is, is the, the junky boilerplate that you're used to there. Nothing... Oh yeah, so the mark, the marks are interesting because we have to add a mime type mark because we're going to serve a wave file from our urbit ship. Okay. We don't have to do very much special with it. We just have to convert the incoming atom, which is just going to be that raw atom uh, that is the wave file into aux for uh, you know bytes um, for the, the regular mime type that is an audio wave file. So if you're going to serve something that's an audio wave file, now we have this, this mime arm uh, that will include things there. Uh, this is the audio, this is a, a mar wave is the name of this. So you've probably run into this where you can't, uh, let me switch back to an urbit. I think there's going to be a lot of this in app workshop of switching back and forth. Too many contexts. All right, let's see. Let's do, let's do this one. All right, so if I were to, um, all right, so I've, I've got a bunch of stupid, uh, these are all copies of the same thing. Um, these uh, silly files here. Let me bar new desk, flap, bar mount, flap. All right, so if I were to make a directory in my Zod that's in flap, that's app, flap. All right. Uh, the latest dev pill is always at https um, bootstrap.urbit.org slash dev latest dot pill. All right. And then let me copy one of these files here over. Uh, app. Flap, good grief. This was the problem. That's why I changed the name partway through because it's got so terrible to type the stuff over and over again. All right, now I'm going to copy this to Zod, Flap, App, Flap. All right, there we go. All right, now if I try to bar commit, what's going to happen? It's going to tell me there's nothing it can do to build a wave file. It has no idea what a wave file is, essentially. So that's the problem that I was solving by including this uh, this mar uh, wave dot hoon value here. So let me v i um, sod flap mar sod flap mar wave.hoon. So now I should be able to bar commit. Oh, I, okay, well, okay. I'd have to copy over mime.hoon. 
and all that, um, which I don't want to do because you know we're at least at least halfway through this. Uh, but you get you get the idea here. Like we we have to solve this problem of can we actually serve the content that we're trying to serve from our urban ship? And you can do this with basically anything that you know the client is going to treat as um, as a what do I want to call this? Um, uh, as raw bytes, anything that's going to be handled as raw bytes, you can just basically pass through a mine type like this uh, as aux, and then it's it's a raw byte stream back out on the other end. So that's that's the that's the handler here for this. There's going to be an index.html that's basically just here's um, here's everything that we have. All right, um, yeah. So there's an action which is receiving. Okay, so an action is our vertical, it's to our client. And then an update is back and forth between our friends because we're lording our score over our friends. Okay. Um, so JSONs from the client, from the browser session will just look like this. So we need to build a simple uh, JSON arm inside of our mark to unwrap that. And updates are sent between peers. Nothing special to do with those because they will all presumably know about this. Um, I'm going to skip the original backend. Yeah, you'll. Uh, this is worth this is worth commenting on right here. So these fast tars are doing the same thing the fast tar was doing with feature UE send HTML. They're loading it via a known mark name. They're loading this as raw data as a raw atom. And then you're able to serve that at particular endpoints. And so this is the way that the serving at the endpoints takes place. So we're using send. It's the same uh, response curry with schooner that we did before. So if we access the JavaScript file, then we're going to send it as plain text. And we're going to convert uh, flap.js from a from a tape to a to a, or excuse me, from a chord to a tape, because it's stored as a chord for us. As an aside. Um, why do we care about the difference between a chord and a tape? Like you, you presumably know what the difference is at this point, right? Like a tape is a list of Pat T and a chord is Pat T, but like, what's the difference? Okay. A chord is linear in memory, right? It's, it's one atom. Yeah. So a chord is one atom. Um, tapes are good for character level operations. They get you the list library things exactly. Um, tapes do take more memory. Why do they take more memory? Yeah, because they're 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 a list in memory. They're in the C jets and everything. They're implemented as as a linked list. So, uh, I think the rule of thumb is they're six times the size of the corresponding chord. So if you need to manipulate it. Um, you know, you convert to a tape, but if you want, and, and, and if you're communicating with something that expects um, text in this format, then I think normally you're going to go through a tape, but that's, that's the difference here and what these have. All right. And then if we, if we were to navigate to apps, flap, image, sprite.png, it would send us with a 200 OK code, it would send us the contents flap, sprite, flap, sprite, with of, of uh, mark image PNG. Like it, it knows that this is a mime type. Uh, so, it, so it unwraps this. This tag, this um, audio, uh, image plane and audio wave, these correspond to the mime types that get sent in headers when we're serving things to the web. But these are actually not commands to air and they're not marks. They are commands to schooner. So then Schooner gets this type tag basically in its uh, uh, Schooner response arm, and then it will correctly build the the uh, mime component of the of the uh, response that's being built here. Uh, we can hop over and take a look at Schooner in a minute if we if we want to to see exactly how that's done. But this is a these are uh, they correspond to mime types, but they're instructions to Schooner um, rather than something else. Okay. All right, in game.js, 
Yeah, the only thing we need to change to get this working the first time is we have to change the paths to be relative paths inside of our current uh, current system. So uh, the first time I did this, I actually hard coded these to whatever the the raw.github.com uh, junk was. But we can serve these locally if we just point to the right endpoint, and then the JavaScript takes care of retrieving this information from our from our uh, local ship in every case there. Which is kind of neat. Like we can actually serve everything. Like our Urbit can be a standalone personal server. Uh, the cores, the cross origin stuff is, uh, I think the way Urbit stuff is set up now, you almost never run into this. But sometimes, uh, depending on how you're you're serving things, if you're if you're dealing with Urbit server and some other server, you can still run into. Oh, are you not seeing me? Uh, Let me give this a shot again. The woes of Zoom. Is that better? Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, this is an example of one where we have a uh, when we when we move from the first version of this to the second, we introduce so the first version of this stored a score and a high score, and then in the second one, we decided to actually keep track of a set of scores, and then the the current score and the set of scores would basically be the set of of uh, high scores. Um, so now there is a there is a state transition in on load that is uh, supported here, and so what this would be is basically let's make Let's uh, start this off by loading scores by putting our current, our old high score into our current scores. And then we've eliminated um, what was a variable in state zero is now no longer a variable in state one. So this is how you would handle that uh, via, via old. Okay. All right, um, PAL stuff. Okay, let's look at PALs first. All right, we're not gonna get like super deep into PALs, except that when you're working with PALs, you're going to subscribe to PALs at the path new PALs. And then it will send you a meet or a part effect whenever something takes place. And this is how you're going to communicate that someone has added you as a pal or deleted you as a pal, which may be the result of a breach or a broken friendship or so forth. Pretty straightforward. You're just uh, basically telling, in this case, we're gonna pass to flap our local flap um, just to, to watch a value or that we're gonna leave a value. So we'll, we'll take a look at what those look like in just a moment. But basically this is us just keeping track of um, the friends that we that we have. Flap is going to keep its own list. And what Flap is going to do, uh oh, it looks like this is the old, old high score. This might be out of date because of the, the state one bit, because uh, that should be something we're putting in scores. But what we're, what we're doing here essentially is uh, look at look at this line here, is if we receive an update from a peer, we're first asserting that the head tag on that update is Lord because that's the only update we recognize. And then we're saying, if the score we received from this friend is higher than the current high score, or if, excuse me, if it's not higher, then return this. If it is higher, then log this to the console, and then put this new score into your, your current scores. All right, so this is all, this is all regular handler stuff, but um, basically PALS generates this whenever we meet or part from someone. And then whenever we receive something, uh, an action from the browser, which gives, uh, which updates our current, state and then gives facts along the flap path to all of our peers whenever they receive one of those updates 
when they receive an update, then they will modify their own local collection of scores. So the keys and scores are your known pals that also have FLAP installed. And then the values are the, are the current high scores. Um, yeah, and then there's, there's some stuff that makes it look, uh, look good here as well. But this is, this is the meat of what FLAP is doing. So it is acting, so, so feature was acting as just a general purpose. Here's an HTML server. Flap is acting like a like a um, a server backend, and then you're actively interacting with it through a JavaScript base front end and sending it information, and then it's processing that information. So it sort of represents uh, the next step up in complexity from um, from what we had before. Uh, let's see. 257. Okay, so we're coming up on an hour in here. All right, there's some reverse forward and reverse proxy stuff that I'm going to punt on for now because I didn't really get it in the shape that I wanted. And there is so much content to talk about that um, there's no way we're ever going to get to everything that I wanted to put into app, app school. Or excuse me, app workshop, but that's, that's fine. Um, let's look at interacting with setting store. because setting store is kind of an interesting one. So let me go back to sharing. Has anyone used setting store before? My guess is that you probably have not explicitly used it before. Yeah, so the basic idea of, of um, setting store and this uh, this one doesn't have it. The basic idea of setting store is, uh, oh, I don't want this, I want one, which is odd. Um, setting store is a key value store. So you can set global things in your ship. Like uh, it was used for landscape preferences, like show me, um, aliases versus just show me ship or you know, ship names. Uh, it was used for, I think it was used for dark mode, light mode, some other things. Uh, so you're able to go ahead and, and actually just interact with it. Uh, let me get the code for Zod because I can never remember it. It's that, if you run into it, it's always that. Oh no, I don't have docs installed on this one. I didn't boot this one with, um, with uh with docs okay one second let me let me switch this up uh, the developer pill has docs installed by default and for some reason the regular pill does not i think it should but that is a different different battle um let me find Do you have any ships that have docs? Winter lag rev knock. All right, let's let's boot winter lag rev knock up and see what that is. No, docs is still supported. It's just it's never been in the main bill. So um All right, so for instance, if you do coal setting store less debug, it will dump the current state of your setting store and you can see the kinds of information that it has here. All right, so setting store takes a desk, it's a, it's a MIP. So a MIP is a desk and a um, collection like a bucket inside of that desk. So you give it a desk, any desk can register its own and then it's responsible for internal management. It re registers whatever collections, buckets it wants inside of it. And then it's a, it's a key value store. Now, what do you notice about the values in setting store? 
There's a sen S, there's a sen B, there's a sen A. They're all JSONs. Setting store is actually a JSON tool. Uh, and it has tools on the outside to interact with it. So you can post JSON to setting store and set keys that way. And you can request keys from setting store uh, to, to uh, interact with it. Don't steal my, uh, my, local, my local moon. Uh, let me change my share here back to the browser just so we can look at the docs real quick on this. If you haven't used docs before, um, it's a thing I'd like to encourage. Let me see if it'll, yeah, there we go, okay. Get my chats in the way here still. Docs basically have you write a markdown description of your agent, and then you can, it's it's uh, just included with whatever, whatever thing you're doing. So like docs itself is documented in docs. Uh, I'm looking for setting store overview here. Yeah, so there's your there's your your MIP desk key bucket, and yeah, so you can you can send a, a put bucket event, or a del bucket, or a put entry, or a del entry, uh, and you can do this either directly internally, or you can do this with uh, with uh, JSON based pokes from outside the ship, and it will manage these things for you. So if you want to set things in a way that's legible to the clear web, then setting store is a reasonably good way to do this with the caveat that until we have user space permissions that Tennis Atlas is currently working on, until we have user space permissions, this is probably not going to be uh, considered secure in a sense, uh, or you know, useful where you can distinguish like, here's what I want local, here's what I want, what I want remote. But this is us going towards the direction of being able to use your urbit as a general purpose, uh, you know, way of, of, of exposing preferences to services and websites and, and so forth as well, just to be able to use setting store. A uh, question here about doc cords. So I do want to go over doc cords. Um, ultimately, I probably will incorporate doc cords into um, app school, but Honestly, my problem right now is that I have not yet figured out how to use doc courts. Um, you know, I read I read the file, but I haven't like actually used it. Seems it like yet. nobody else has either. Yeah. So, and I think it's just something where we just need some good scripts on how to do it. Right. Like it's like it's it's interesting. It's neat. Um, uh, we're sort of the dog that caught the car and has to figure out what to do with it now that we've got it. Um, so they're they're powerful, but we don't have anything to do with it. Uh, doc cords are basically you can build comment documentation uh, similar to the way that uh, Java and some other languages do Python. Uh, you can build documentation into your comments that can then be exposed elsewhere. Um, there's also a new ARM. What's what's the new? It's one of the LUS arms that was just added. Oh, what is it? There's no documentation on it yet. It was added. It was added in like January, um, and it's going to let you do type aliases. And that's I think it's kind of related to uh, what's going on with this. Or is it, is it Buck LUS? So it's not. It's not a LUS. Buck LUS sounds right. I haven't messed with it yet, but it's a it's a good one to to take a look at. Um, so yeah, doc cords would only be command line only right now, but they're a, they're a thing to keep an eye on, you know, once we figure out how to make them more, more legible and useful to people. Anyway, uh, where I was gonna go with, uh, with settings store is I have some code that I did extract from the much longer tutorial on, on, uh, building a reverse proxy that I think would be valuable for you to see just on how do you actually work with um, how do you actually work with dot courts let me uh, or excuse me with a setting store 
Uh, this is AWL zero. Yeah. Okay. So here's some. All right. I'm going to shrink a little so we can fit things on lines a little bit better there. All right. So this would be mush as the desk. So uh, you don't need to do anything fancy with it other than mush as a desk. So in this case, you're going to have loaded the settings store structure and library stuff. So we'll have that available. So the first thing you have to do is you have to create a bucket. So you're going to put a bucket. You're going to give it the name of the desk. I think that is not coercive. I think you can create it with any name, but for ship hygiene, you should stick to the, the desk you're on. And then any name for the bucket inside of the, you know, the collection inside of the, the desk's bucket there. And then in this case, I'm going from settings keys to value keys. So those will be the, the JSON types from that. And then I'm going to pass that card to settings store as a poke. So that's how I'm going to create an empty bucket. And then any ship will be able to see and work with it. If I want to put an entry, so here a bucket is just an entry in that in that map. Um, so settings store uh, stores values as MIP desk collection. Uh, value something like that. So a MIP a MIP is a two keyed map. So it ends up it ends up being a little complicated. Uh, I think that there was actually an instance of it all broken out here. It actually looks like that. So it's a, it's a map of a desk to a map of a key to a map of a key to a value. This key being questionably named is what I call the collection up above. All right. So that's so I'm I was using bucket um, in two senses a moment ago, but this is one this is one way. Um, so. Anyway, so this is this is how we'll, we'll we'll set this up here. So an empty bucket is then a top level. I'm registering that there's a desk that's going to have an empty collection. So that's what I've, I've set up here. And then to put an entry in, I'm going to register this as a put entry. There, okay, I'll, I'll try and do this kind of highlighting so it's easier to read. And then this goes from a from a key to a value. All right. So whatever DSIG and all, I think DSIG was doing this because these are uh, um, ships that for some reason I had to take the uh, the SIG off the front of the ship names when I was building this. And then we just pass that in to, to build the thing. So this this lets us uh, treat this as this, this general store. And then to use this value, then we would subscribe. So there'll be a subscribe to whatever the uh the so we'll give it a wire so we know where we're getting these things back and we're going to subscribe to watch at bucket um bucket name doesn't change there the word bucket doesn't change there um and then the desk and then the collection inside of that so we're going to subscribe to that and then whatever we want to value we're going to to have to um so we're going to subscribe at this point, and then we're going to get a gift back that's going to be uh, the the uh, values that we're getting back to back from this. So the pros of setting store, it is JSON compatible, first order JSON compatible. It is included on every Urbit ship, and it has a pretty good uh, internal data structure. The cons of setting store are that it's simply, it turns out that it's a pain to turn all of your information into JSON because JSON has a different data model than Hoon. So if you're storing things that aren't intended for browsers, then setting store is probably a questionable 
uh, a questionable case for you. Um, the I'm, I'm working on an app right now called Global Store that's mostly together. Uh, I haven't uh, validated the subscriptions yet, so um, hopefully we'll get this one out there. But Global Store is just it's a it's a map it's a MIP like like setting store, but it just stores urban values as uh, as vases, I believe, if I recall correctly. So it will just store the raw information for you in urbit hoon compatible values and then you're able to use it but it doesn't have the external interface uh, so the, the reason i bring up setting store in this context here is because this the the interface of the the put entry put bucket and all this uh and the json compatibility means that this is a thing you can use when you are using urbit as a server in particular all right um i think that's a pretty good collection of server stuff we will discuss the client side more in some subsequent lessons. So in the fifth lesson or the sixth lesson, one of those lessons I'm going to talk about client redirects. So, you know, if you carry out an action and you would like it to return to this page after this action is done or redirect to a different page, how do you do that correctly? Um, how do you, you know, instruct the client to do that correctly? We'll, we'll cover that in a later lesson as well. Uh, it's going to be boilerplate the same way where it's like, okay, you know, once you know how to do it, you don't have to like redirect from scratch every single time. And I'm going to defer the agent wrapper stuff. Um, so I don't intend to go over Rudder it in App Workshop. Um, it's worth me just keeping a list of things that you request that would be useful. So I guess the other one was dot cords. Um, I mean, so I was thinking of it mainly as a uh, an example of the kind of uh, agent wrapping stuff that you can do, um, which is still an interesting open question, I think. Yeah, there's so. I, I went through a phase when I was kind of an agent wrapper maximalist. Like they're really cool and they're really powerful. Um, one of the problems that you run into is that because if, you, if you've gone and look at the core variance model of what's covariant and contravariant and everything, then it turns out that agents don't expose their internal information very well. Uh, in a way that a, that an external wrapper can handle, and so you 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 can do certain things from inside a wrapper, but you can't do other things easily from inside the wrapper. So you know one particular example that I, that I've I've been working on is a scry wrapper that would automatically expose FASX, FAS whatever uh, endpoints for everything in your state. Um, but it turns out that getting the faces of everything in your state is non-trivial. It can be done, but it's actually like kind of hard to figure out how to, you know, give it an agent. If someone hands you an agent as a library, you know, here's an agent. Uh, how do you actually get the information from inside the agent out? Because an agent is set up a certain way because you want to be able to do things like, like cab this. You know, you want to be able to use the agent as a as a model of a, of how to how to build things. Yeah. So so um, Jack X um, Wickram Wickram's uh, talk on middleware and and building agent wrappers is a good one because he gets into like some of these limitations. Like, what are things you can do with an agent wrapper? What are things you can't do with it? Uh, there's also an app workbook entry on the debugging wrapper, uh, less debug generator attaches to that. Um, that's worth looking at. Um, I'll I'll punt on that for now. Maybe we we may come back to that in a later lesson. Um, the other lesson that I think is also worth spending some time on, that I think we won't have time for today, is Ahoy, which is monitoring ship uptime. That's a little bit different from server action, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it out for now. Uh, but I think we're I think we're in a pretty good 
pretty good place for the content we've covered here. So this is basically, you know, how do you how do you treat your Herbit ship as a as a as a generic all-purpose uh, server? Uh, what other questions are there? I saw there's a few things up in the chat, but I think we've addressed those. Yeah, okay. All right, if that's what we have for today. Yeah, no homework. The homework is for you to read the notes when I post them and probably complete the tutorials, but uh, your completion of App School will be entirely based on the challenge exercises, which synthesize a lot of things that's going on from this. So. That's your that'll that'll be your deliverable, then um, at, at at the end of this. So, um, oh yes, office hours. So we will. Okay, what we're going to do with office hours? So you know we've been doing this build party thing, um, on the on the network. Excuse me. What we're going to do is I'm going to schedule one to three p.m. 1 to 3 p.m. on Fridays, Central Time. And I'm going to call that the AWL Build Party. And it's basically bring your own code, bring your own questions, like whatever whatever you have going on, uh, you know, if it's going to be the, the challenge exercise submission, whatever, bring it. And we'll just try and have a lot of smart people in the room. and talk through what's going on with it and see how it see how it works. The this Friday we're um, tablet mod nice and I are going to be building a greater agent that we're going to be using in app school and hoon school so we'll have to figure out some things to make that work correctly but it'll be kind of an interesting interesting problem there. Um, yeah, I think we're Yeah, DistroDazad, Lapdag, Battery Payload, and then there's the Gather Town link for you. Well, the challenge exercises culminate in the final capstone project. Will the capstone project be started at the end? Um, no to both. So the challenge exercises are kind of, well, okay. Um, I guess I'm, I'm using challenge in two, in two senses there, and I shouldn't do that. Um, so there are some exercises at the end of every lesson from the notes here that are challenge exercises that are just like go you know, figure out how to extend schooner or or what have you. And then there's the challenge exercise slash capstone project. That's that's the same thing uh, in the sense I was using that there will be a capstone project uh, that are I, I have scoped out three, easy, medium, hard, and you're eligible to submit other things that you work on as part of app school with this. But it's got to be an app school or excuse me, app workshop thing. It's got to be like with this. And it has to be of commensurate uh, complexity to at least one of those. I'm going to encourage you to do them in, as pairs as well and do pair programming for it because I think um, you get much better horizontal knowledge transfer that way where you're just seeing someone else work and it's useful because you pick up tricks and, and ways of thinking about it. And talking through it, I think, is, is a good pattern. Uh, this is what we're trying to do with the build, with the the build parties on Friday is uh, just code in public, right? Um, you know, last last time we did it, um, we had some Min and Fabler gave us some very good input on how to get the the uh, jail scries correct uh, and so forth. So you know, we're just gonna turn turn Fridays and in particular Friday afternoons into a bunch of smart people in a room talking about apps. And so if you have an app that you're stuck, if you're, you've got a gumption trap somewhere, you're just trying to figure out how to make it work, then you know, bring it to the, the app workshop um, hours and have smart people figure it out and tell you how to fix it. Sounds good. <laughs>